on here. Ken Gagne, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you. This is good. Excellent. Welcome. That's the first thing that's worked today. So I'm going to pull up. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Oh, that's not you. There you are. There you are. So here I am. We're, we're going to start the tournament. Now, if, if you're watching this on YouTube and you want to participate, uh, what you need to do is go to lon.tv Mario Kart Live. lon.tv slash Mario Kart Live. And that will uh, get you in here. And uh, I'm going to switch over now to our tournament here. This is me, so I got I to gotta pick my guy here. Now let me pump up the audio a little bit. This is like um, we are determined to get thrown off uh, YouTube from the revenue, right? Because they don't like when we people do this. Uh, let's see. So which one should I go with here? I'm, I'm picking out my uh, car. Let me go. Oh, I got a new one here. Let me use that one. Well, I don't know how many of you have you've unlocked yet. Have, can you play as yourself? Can you use your me? Oh, I can use my. I don't think I can use my me yet. Uh, I guess you haven't gotten that far yet. Yeah. So we got Jimmy in here. Yeah, Jimmy is somebody I'm racing against right now, as we speak, actually. Oh, so We're I at the I Dolphin. Can watch Shoal. you in the meantime, right? I think so. I think that we will let you do that. I just hit him with a bomb, zip past him into first, and he's trying to hit me with a red shell. He had two red shells. One of them hit me. The other I was trailing behind me, but it wasn't enough, and I still came in first. Sorry, Jimmy. <laughs> so Jimmy is knocked out. I think we've got like eight um, eight races going here. So that's that's going to be the max on uh, on this. So, and then I think after we're done with the races, Ken, maybe we'll do a little um, kind of little preview uh, or review of the old uh, the old Mario Karts. How does that sound? Sounds great. All right. Okay, so I now see three people involved in the races: Jimmy and somebody else. Now that's you. That's me. I'm here. Yeah, so there are three of us now. There's three of Excellent. us now, so we'll get, uh, I'm going to pick random here, and we'll see who uh, pops in here. I like the Grumble Volcano, but I chose Toad's Highway this time. All right, so we'll see what comes up. Now, Ken, while we play, um, we'll talk yes, a little bit about some uh, retro stuff here. I want to wait until 9.45 to the official start time here. Now, what do these points represent? This is your, your standing so far in the tournament? That's how many points you've earned in this tournament. So, so I came in first last time, so that got me three points. Jimmy came in second, earned him one. So and you, you haven't raced yet, so you have zero. So if you get in late, you're kind of at a disadvantage, I guess, right? Yes, you need to compete in all the races to have a fair shot. Now the coins, I guess you accumulate these coins and you get... Uh, you can get new uh, unlock stuff. Is that the, the purpose of those? Yeah, they're twofold. One is the number of coins you collect over the course of your entire history playing the game will unlock cus uh, customizations for your vehicle. Okay. But also within each individual race, the coins increase your max top speed up to 10 coins. That's interesting. Yeah. And for you folks joining us, we are playing right now. So you, if you go to lon.tv slash Mario Kart Live, uh, you can uh, get the code to join this tournament and, and join me and Ken and Jimmy from New York. And I am horrible at this game, as you can see. <laughs> oh, you didn't tell me you were going to be horrible. Oh, yeah, I was, I was really bad. You see, you see how bad I was during your tournament last week? It was, uh, it was, it was <laughs> embarrassing. Yeah, but I lost my own tournament. I practiced all weekend for that. <laughs> well, here's what I found, is that no matter how good you think you are, there's always somebody better at, at, the, at the game. Oh, yeah, that's absolutely true. That's why I told them that I'm not giving a prize to whoever beats me, because there's going to be a lot of those people. I'm giving a prize to whoever comes in first. <laughs> that guy and came actually, in, like, really first, didn't he? He was light years beyond everybody. Well, the person who actually came in first dropped out before the last race, but despite that, he still had the highest score, so he won, but I don't think he knew that because he never contacted me to claim his prize. Oh, really? Yeah, so I gave the prize to whoever came in second. I was hoping maybe you'd give it to whoever came in last place. <laughs> I don't want to incentivize them sucking. <laughs> I, want, I want some actual competition here. I may not be the best, but I am pretty good. You know, uh, way, when I was... Oh, right. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I was going to say, for people watching, if, um, again, they can join the, uh, the tournament, if you go into lon.tv slash Mario Kart Live, so you can play Ken and me and Jimmy from New York. Somebody's firing fireballs at me, and I'm, like, so far behind, I'm being lapped up. Um, Whoops. There's I was looking at my room. game at the map and I thought this. Ooh, well, there we go. 
Yeah, I wish there was a map on the screen so I could see how everybody's doing. When I look down at my gamepad, I take my eyes off the TV and I lose track of where I'm going. You know what this needs is a spectator mode. Because it's got that when you first come in, right? Right. But it doesn't, you can't like be just the spectator, because that would be really cool for streaming. I could like kind of t uh, make a little production out of it. Well, Nintendo has said that there's no value in just watching other people play games. That's why they're not integrating with Twitch. I'm going to talk about this on Friday during my weekly wrap-up because I think I bought this game because I saw you playing it. Like, you drove oh. my sale. And I didn't even get a cut of it. No, you, did you have an affiliate link on your thing? I mean, you can buy Mario Kart through Amazon, and I will get a cut of that, but that's it. That's it. Right, so it's like 4%. Or 1%. Maybe it's 1%. I think they reduced it, didn't they? I think it starts at 4 and then it goes up based on how many items you sell per month. Okay. Yeah, I have. I did a YouTube video on how to upgrade your Xbox hard drive. And I actually made more on the affiliate link in the video description than I did on ads on the video. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah. So I just got a warning here that said... Um, Nintendo owns the audio content, so I might actually turn down the audio here. <laughs> Where are you getting that warning? Uh, I got it on the uh, the control panel, so I don't want to get... Um, we, we could run into a situation where Nintendo pulls us off the air because we use their audio. Is that, that, be, that you, YouTube thing. or Google Hangout you're talking about? No, this is the uh, the YouTube thing. So I'm, not, I'm looking on, uh, on my live control panel. Let me see if I can pull it up here. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I mean, they... I, th I think they'll prevent you from monetizing it, but they shouldn't prevent you from broadcasting it. Yeah, it was like I got like a warning. It said, you are in an intentional violation. Interesting. Now, it's funny, it, and I've seen this happen before on these Google Plus events. So we had about 20 or 25 say they were going to come and see this. And we're only, only got about five in here right now. So. Mm. Well, it was kind of last minute. We just posted it today. That's true. That's true. Had a lot of RSVPs, though. It was pretty good. So we'll just keep an eye on the uh, viewership, and then when uh, more folks come in, we'll talk a little bit more. So I think this is probably the best Mario Kart game ever made. You know, I think as far as ra the racing element goes, you may be correct, but for me, a big part of any Mario Kart experience is the battle mode, and this game has the worst battle mode I've ever seen. I've, I've played it a little bit, and it's just kind of driving around in circles, right? There's really no... Exactly. You spend it. most of your time looking for your opponents instead of actually fighting them. You know, in the Super Nintendo Mario Kart, the original, the levels were so small and constrained, you always knew where the other person was. Right, and now it's... And now it's so not. Big, like, right. You know, you need to be racing against 11 other people just for the hope that you'll encounter somebody to fight. Right, I see. It's so, far less frenetic. So for those watching, this this is me playing, and I am horrible. I, I, still, I just haven't had time to, like, really master the uh, the game here. Oops. Now, I never had a Super Nintendo growing up. I ended up, um, my college roommate had one. So that's when I started playing with the Super Nintendo. So what systems did you have growing up? Well, I had a uh, Nintendo Entertainment System. Everybody had that, right? Um, did you have one? Absolutely. Yep. I had systems before and after that, but I definitely had the Nintendo. Now, we're the same age, right? So you're, you're what, 30, in your mid-30s, right? Exactly. You're so, a little older than me. Okay. So, because when I, I think um, I first saw the Nintendo, actually a friend of mine had one. And I was at like Toys R Us one day and I saw this thing. I was like, wow, this thing's really cool. Because it had the robot. That was like the... Rob the robot. Rob yep. the robot, right? Because that was the only the... option you could get. I think this was like 1987. And a friend of yeah, mine bro... had it. And he was just all about the... Uh, you know, he was all about this thing. He was really like, oh, it's great. And I was, you know, I was questioning him about the, the control pad and, you know, can you even play a game? Because remember, this was before that I had an Atari and a, and a ColecoVision, which were, you know, stick-based uh, kind of things. Um, right. And uh, it was, uh, you know, a big deal, this whole thing. And so I got mine, I forgot when I got it, but I, I think I was in sixth grade. So it must have been like 87, 88. I think is when uh, when mine showed up, and it was 
yeah, somebody just, my, my friend of mine just texted me, he says, Are, am I even trying? <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> Yes, I'm, I am trying, but it's this is hard. <laughs> I did um, almost lap you there. Come on. Yeah, I know. I got I to gotta really focus here. Well, I'm trying to talk and like be interesting. See, I don't grasp. I have a hard time grasping the concept that people will actually be entertained watching us play video games. But apparently that is a that is a thing, right? Well, I, apparently you and I are not quite as entertaining as PewDiePie. No, we're not because <laughs> we'd have we'd have 800,000 people watching now versus five. I mean, I understand the appeal of Let's Plays. I don't understand it to the extent that PewDiePie is the number one YouTube channel. And and you're doing these Let's Plays, right? That's your that's your thing. And you're getting a lot of viewership on that, right? It depends on the game. Uh, the, the unboxings are my bread and butter. Right, okay. Ah, oh, I missed an item. Darn. So I just got the notification on my phone that the event is starting, so... Oh, at 9:53. Yeah. Wasn't it originally scheduled for 9:30? Yeah, I put it on the Google um, the Google event notification. So I would imagine my subscribers get the notifications. What time did you put it on the Wii U for the tournament? Oh, 9:45. Oh, okay. Or, or 9:30? No, was. I think it was 9:30 actually. Whatever time I did it this afternoon at lunchtime, I think was when I stopped in and set that up. All right, so here we go. Now I'm in the game here, Jimmy. I'm coming for you. My Koopa shell is not hitting you. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Lon. Good Thank job. You, yeah. Now, if and anyone I'm watching, a... if you're in the on the calendar, the event page, if you can just tell me how the stream looks to you, I would appreciate it. I'm just curious how well my uh, stuff is working here. And will there be a video available for people to watch after the fact? Yes. And in fact, I need to get in there before and trim it so all the Nintendo music I was playing when it was in the uh, preview mode is... Uh... Yeah, so I had the Nintendo, and then I fr a friend of mine, it was an older kid, you know, like one of the big kids, he had a Sega. And mm -hmm. Sega had better... Sega graphics. Genesis or uh, Sega Master System? System. Master System. Oh, okay. And, I've and never then, known anybody to have one of those. Oh, really? I, I knew like two or three people that had one of them. So my friend Steve had one, and then my friend Gary had one. And Gary was like the older high school kid, and that was like really cool. So if Gary had it, I, I was like, that that's something I got to have too. So I got one. And they had like this ultra mega set, which had a um, had a 3D glasses. Like real, not like those crappy blue and red, uh, red ones. Uh -huh. it, was, it was a you know, shutter-based uh, 3D glasses system that was powered by uh, the card slot on the, on the Sega Master System. The Sega Master System had the cartridges, and then you could also use these cards, which were like these smaller games. So you could um, actually play 3D games, and they, and they were good. Like, they were actual real 3D on your television set. Hmm. And so there was a packing game that was built into the system. It was like this um, missile command kind of thing, and it was wild. Like, you used the light gun. And the missiles would literally like come out of the screen at you. It was really, it was impressive. It was really impressive. And Super Dell says he's everything is looking good, so that's a that's a good thing. Thank you, Excellent. Super Dell, for letting us know about that. So we are playing Mario Kart 8, and Ken Gagney from Game Bits. He's on audio only. He's still working on his video stuff, but he will uh, soon will do some video stuff. And we're in the basement studio. Um, for those of you wondering, this is the setup. I've, I've reduced a lot of equipment because I got this Teradek video, and that is what we're streaming out of. So I'm running a video out of my switcher into this and out to the internet, and it is working, like, really well. I'm, I'm like, oh, I forgot to put the shot up here. Uh, here's the Teradek, and it is, uh, it's working exceptionally well. I'm really, uh, I'm really, really impressed with this. So uh, it is operating. We've got the Wii U running through the scaler, and we can see that here. We stopped the music because I was getting copyright warnings from YouTube while I was streaming that I was violating Nintendo's copyright. So <laughs> Nintendo is not friendly to YouTubers. I'm going to um, talk about this on uh, Friday for my wrap-up about maybe some ways that we can let Nintendo know that they need to be more attentive to us, the YouTubers. Now, if you want to join us, you can. Go to lon.tv slash Mario Kart Live, and that'll get you, uh, get you right in. So, Ken, I'm reading so this book called uh, Console Wars. Have you heard of it? Yes. The one that's being turned into a documentary by Seth Rogen? Yes. It's going to be a documentary and a feature film. So, there are two different things? 
Yeah, they're they're making a documentary right now, and then they're going to make an entertaining feature film, like a you know, fi you know, uh, historical fiction, <laughs> if you will. Right. So, um, so anyway, I had a I had a master system. So you had a Nintendo. Did, what, yeah, you're you... you're just older enough than me that none of my friends had a master system. We were more like Nintendo versus Sega Genesis. Got it. Oh, okay. So you were just a little bit ahead of me. So, by the way, if if you're into that era, you will love that book, Console Wars. So um, one of the things that happens when I play video games, I end up like just going off in tangents and not finishing my, my thoughts here. Uh, but the, uh, so I had the master system and then I was at the mall, you know, the, the shopping mall, and there was this newsstand store there that, where they had all the latest magazines. And I found these gaming magazines, like they were about video games. They had just come out. One was Electronic Gaming Monthly. And yep, EGM. The, uh, yeah, EGM, still around, right? Uh, actually, I'm not sure. Oh, well, they were recently. I've, yeah, I've lost track. Me too. I can't. I don't read these things anymore. Uh, and uh, there was EGM, and then there was Game Players. Yes, I and, think I had that one too. And they had all this stuff from like what was in Japan right now, right? <laughs> and it was like this. Japan was like this amazing place because they had all this futuristic stuff that we didn't have or never could get. <laughs> so. I'm reading the magazine, and they're talking about this thing called the Sega Genesis. And I was a big Sega fan, and I was like, what the heck is this? And it's a 16-bit system, and da, da 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 And I was just captivated. And they had screenshots, of course. And, you know, um, and if you read these magazines now, they're written to, like, an eighth grader, which is what I was yep. at the time. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I was reading about it. I was really excited about it. I had, this, I had this cable show that I started almost as a result of these magazines because I, I was starting to, like, do a show about – um, something I wanted to do a TV show on the cable access station, and I said, "Well, may as well do it about video games." How old were you? I was, I was uh, thirteen when I started this. W with your own cable TV show? Yeah, they had the you know the cable access station. What happened was there was this kid who was in like the local paper for having this like talk show about whatever on the cable access channel, and I, and I was like, "Wow, anybody can have their own TV show. This is amazing." So I, I did like, um, had a friend of mine, we did it together and I had like, I think we did like four episodes. It was hard because you had a, your mom had to drive you everywhere, you know? <laughs> um, so we did that and um, we almost got an early like demo unit of the Mega Drive to like the marketing people were really close to giving us one and they, then they thought better of it. Uh, which was like such a heartbreaker. Like the, the woman that ran the access station was like trying to get this thing for us. but. Couldn't get it. And then back then, they didn't have release dates. So, the, by the way, did I, oh, I almost came in second. Jimmy, did Jimmy leave? Is that why he's gray? Oh, I, I didn't notice. Oh. So oh, anyway. I, I mean, I think, I think he's playing as Metal Mario. Oh, so that okay. might be why he's gray. Got it. So, um, so we, didn't get, we didn't get a hold of this thing, unfortunately. But I was at the, the Toys R Us. And what do you know? There's a Sega Genesis for sale like in the, the case where you had to pull the ticket out. Yep. And I was like, oh, I got I to gotta get this thing. <laughs> and uh, thus began like saving up for the, uh, the summer, you know. And uh, I worked for my dad's business back then so I could legally work at that age at minimum wage, you know, which was like $4.25 or something. Um, so I think like around September I got the Genesis. That thing was awesome. Now, you said that Game Players was talking about the Sega Genesis in Japan, but over there it would have been called the Mega Drive. Right, exactly. So it was called the Mega Drive, and then they said it was going to be called the Genesis in the United States, kind of like the rebirth of Sega. And yeah. um, it, was a, it was amazing. Like, when you got that you know, thing it, home, it was incredible. It, it's funny to think of Sega as a Japanese company because it was founded by an American. Was it really? Yeah, it was a war veteran who wanted to make games available to soldiers who were overseas. Oh, so he, that's what Sega stands for, is service games. Oh, interesting. That's games cool for idea. people who are in the service. That is and cool. he was in Japan when he founded it, but right. he himself was an American. You know, I think that book touched on it a little bit, and I was just kind of confused. I was, um, okay, that, makes, that, that, that lines up with what I was reading. That's right. Yeah, it's a good... Um, it's a good company, you know, they, and they had some good stuff, except like Nintendo was so, they had these draconian policies about how they were um, going to handle the marketplace. So if you upset Nintendo as a retailer, 
Oh, I almost got you, Jimmy. He had no idea I was firing turtle shells at him. Hmm. You are beneath his notice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm beneath most people's notice, unfortunately. Yeah, so, Nintendo has some very draconian licensing policies. And uh, if, if, if you published a game with somebody else, then you were not going to publish with Nintendo. And they had a, you know, a, the majority of the market share, so you did not right. want to upset them. It was almost anti-competitive. Oh, very much so. It's funny, that though, that you would say that retailers wouldn't want to piss off Nintendo because a few years later, Sega really pissed off retailers themselves when uh, I think it was, like, E3-01 or E3... No, it was E3-97 or 96 where oh, the, the, Sega Saturn was, the Sega Saturn was going to be coming out. Right, right, and it, right. It was scheduled to come out in September. Right, and, they, and like, was, they they dumped it on the market, right? Like earlier. Right. I I was at that E3 when it happened. Sega had their annual press conference, and then you know they talked about how great the Saturn was going to be, and then they said, "And big surprise, it's, it's available today." <laughs> oh my god, that's right. <laughs> it's like you can walk into your Toys R Us right now, or your KB Toys, and buy it. Oh, that's great. And and they thought this was going to be this great idea that they would scoop all the competition, but all they did was upset retailers because KB Toys wasn't in on this deal and they lost out on all these sales and also all these game developers who are, you know, you want to have a game out on launch day because that's when people are going to be attaching software to their hardware and they missed this window by four months because they were aiming for September and the system came out in May. And you know what the worst part was, I, I remember that because they also had the 32X that they were trying to sell at the same time. Sega had, they were trying to support way too many platforms. There was the Genesis, the Sega CD, right. the 32X, the 32X CD, the Saturn, the Game Gear. It was just, that was one of the reasons that they went down, is because they were just, they divided their own house. I bought the 32X for like 20 bucks in, in 1997. It was like in the, in the you know, the, bar, the bargain bin. <laughs> yep. The, that's about how much I spent on each my Jaguar, my 3DO, and my Virtual Boy. Oh, you had a 3DO? I didn't know that. I got all these things years after they went out of business. They were just, you okay. know, like 30 bucks each. So you got them when they were liquidated. I bought the 3DO like when it was 3.99 or something. It was, oh, it was. Which is better than when it came out at what 800? Yeah, it was like 800 dollars. It's insane. Ridiculous. It was insane, and everybody wanted the um, uh, the Neo Geo. Oh, yeah. You know, I had a memory card for that, so I could go to the arcade and save my game and come back a week later and pick up where I left off. Oh, no kidding. I didn't realize I had something like that. That's yeah, you could save your game in the arcade and then continue it at home or vice versa, or you could just keep going back to the arcade. And really? If, if not your saved game, at least your high score. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, I still have that memory card somewhere. I haven't seen it in years, but I, I can't believe I would have thrown it out. Maybe my parents did, but it's around somewhere. That's really cool. Yeah, I booted oh. up my 3DO last year for the first time in a long time. And I have saved mm -hmm. games on there from 20 years ago that are still on the system. Your memory, your memory card still works after all this time? Actually, the internal memory on the system, believe it or not. Wow. It's, uh, yeah, it's remarkable. It's really something. I didn't, I didn't even know it had internal memory. The PlayStation 1 and 2 didn't. Yeah, no, it had, uh, had internal memory. I think it was like a battery backup kind of thing. So. Gotcha. But even those are known to fail. I mean, you every now and then you need to pop open your original Zelda gold cartridge and replace the battery in there. Right, right, that's right. That thing was, it would die in the middle of the game. That was the worst part. Well, if you didn't hold down the reset button while turning the system off, you might lose the game you were just playing. Oh, okay, that was it. Hey, am I in first place? How did that happen? No, I'm in first. Oh. Nice I'm, try. I was only lap one, never mind. Okay, I got excited. <laughs> it's true, there's as many laps as there are racers. <laughs> Whoops. Ooh. So uh, Super Dell in the chat room asks, and I, I would love to hear your thought on this as a, because you were working the press, working in the press for a while in this in this field. Um, he wants to know if the Wii U is going to survive. Absolutely. They had a really it, strong show at E3, right? Yeah, I mean a lot of press outlets say that Nintendo basically won E3, even though they weren't even. They didn't even hold a press conference. Just like last year, they did it all online. Uh, to be honest, I'm a little confused by the people who say that Nintendo won E3. I think they had a strong showing, but there weren't really a lot of surprises as far as I'm concerned. Hmm. 
You know, like they announced that there's going to be a new Zelda game next year. Well, right, did anybody is... ever think that there wasn't going to be a Zelda <laughs> right. for the Wii U? Right. And, you know, that's yeah. true. I mean, in many ways, we're just playing the same games, just updated, right? Like they're, they're... I mean, they, they, you know, they did have some new ones, like that paintball game. Yeah, Splatoon. That looks pretty fun. You know, it doesn't really look revolutionary. Like, people are like, oh, Nintendo's being so bold and developing new IP in a genre that people want to play. I'm like, well, I don't know that's a game I want to play. But I also understand I'm very much not the typical gamer. I made a list the other day of all the major franchises I haven't played, and I was surprised at how long that list was. I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm sure your list is as long as mine, actually. Well, I was watching the latest Anita Sarkeesian video on Feminist Frequency, and she was listing all these uh, portrayals of women in video games, and I'm like, I've never played those games. I had no idea the problem was this widespread. Yeah, it's funny, because my, my wife was a gamer when she was a kid. She was a a really big Zelda and Mario fan. Those were her games. Uh -huh. And it was funny because when we, when we started dating, I had this emulator running, and she I, I never saw – I didn't see my computer for a week after that. Uh -huh. uh, she, she, she plays through Zelda like as therapy. Like she's, she's probably – since I've known her, Zelda 1, it's all she plays. Uh, she's played through it probably um, ten times. Since first I've known quest her. or second? Uh, the, the, she does the first and second quest in the first Zelda. It's like her, uh, it's oh. like her therapy. So we were waiting for the baby. Oh, she... That's what she was doing for for weeks. <laughs> so she does, she does both quests. That's pretty good. Yeah, she does. Goes right through the whole thing. I was like, wow, well, I think I picked. The I would right, like to... the right one. I would like, I would like to do a right let's one. play of that game sometime. You know that that would be fun because I I think um, you know what's funny and talking about like the retro stuff. Video games were a lot more expensive when we were kids. For Ex on a number more... of levels. They're more expensive. You said they were. I think maybe proportionate to our earning power they were, but I th I remember Nintendo games being like anywhere from tw twenty to forty bucks. Yeah, it was like the the when they when I bought the Nintendo in 1988 dollars, it was like twenty nine bucks a game, and then right. it started creeping up to like forty four ninety nine, forty nine ninety nine. Like it was in it was it was it took a while. So, oh, so it turns out my college roommate is Jimmy. Oh, so Jim Lutz you, is uh, is Jimmy. Is he somebody you've kept in touch with since college, oh, or yeah. is this just yep. random? <laughs> yeah, I talked to him. This would be a strange reunion. Yeah, no, not definitely not a strange reunion. We used to do actually. Jimmy was the guy that had the Super Nintendo in my dorm room. <laughs> so, oh hey, so we played Pilot Wings a lot. That was that was a lot of fun. You played which game? Pilot Wings. Oh, Pilot Wings. Yep, that was a good one. I wish they'd do another one of those. That one's a fun. That was a fun game. I really got a lot out of that one. I have that on the, uh, I think on the GameCube. Or something. I have, I have like a there, modern version of it somewhere. There was one for Super Nintendo and one for N64. Oh, maybe that's all I have then. Might be what yeah. Is. yeah. Ah, crap. Ooh. Oh, Jimmy just like double whammied me here. Although I did see a game at E3 that is being built as an exploration game where you can go like from planet to planet and just kind of wander around. Yeah, that looked awesome. I, I, that's by the guys that made like some mobile game on the iPhone. Everyone's like shocked that they came up with this as their second thing. And like it's a, it's a pre-generated universe. It's like thousands of planets. It looks really cool. It reminds me of like Trade Wars that we used to play on the BBS systems here. So, oh, I used to play Trade Wars. I was I was addicted to Trade Wars, and it's still out there. Trade Wars. Oh yeah, you can still play it. Almost anything like Lord of the Red Dragon, Usurper, they're all still out there. But the only people that play it now are people that are like ridiculously good at it. And <laughs> so I went in there. I, I found like one server for Trade Wars. This is a Telnet BBS game for anyone wondering. So. They were, um, they were so good that the second I got into it, I had like all these like horrible things attached to my ship. <laughs> and I, I, I was just this innocent trader, you know, and, and I've been, I was bamboozled by the, uh, the technology of these pirates who have just been playing for so long that they, uh, I guess they reset the games like every week because people just get too powerful too quickly. No, I remember I was so addicted to this game that I think there was a BBS called Cyber Source in Shrewsbury, Mass., or mm -hmm. something like that. And I emailed the sysop and I said, "If I paid you twenty dollars, would you give me twenty thousand credits in Trade Wars?" <laughs> you know, I never even thought to pay off the uh, the sysop. Well, he said yes. Oh, did he really? And, oh my god. And so, without earning all this money, I just suddenly got it in my in-game bank account. Now, how'd you get him the money? Because there, there wasn't PayPal at that point. Oh, uh, I just sent him a check. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's hysterical. Makes you wonder how much who else bought him off. 
Oh, he said that nobody had ever mentioned it to him before, and he had never even occurred to him. Oh, that's hysterical. And and I wasn't even playing to be competitive. Like, for example, on the Super Nintendo, this version of SimCity for the SNES, yeah. there was a code where you could just start off with, like, $9 million. Oh, my God. And, and every time I played the game, I would use that code. And you might think I was cheating, but I just loved being able to build without constraint. And that even with all that money, I still found it challenging to figure out where should I put the commercial district, the right. residential district, you know? Yeah. How many fire stations should I have? It was like playing with Legos, and I didn't want to be limited in how many Legos I had. Right, right. That makes sense. And so I just wanted to develop all these planets and trade wars. I didn't care that there were other players. And, that, and that's true, because I, I found I had, like, this little uh, BBS I had set up a little while ago. Not the Apple one. The uh, This was um, uh, Synchronet. And I had trade wars running, and I was hoping to get some friends in to play with. But, you know, I ended up, like, having a good time on my own with it it was uh it was pretty cool so yeah. we got some comments from the chat room ken oh what are so they saying they have some questions for us or for let's hear them let's see what we got here so well actually no just uh some folks some saying that we're here so night game fx night gamer fx is here welcome and be sure to uh hit the um the, the link or the number for the tournament is in the uh, description here so you can pop in and look at that and then super Del was asking because he asked about whether the wii u will survive or not and he said he's asking yes. because um, they've had it a year and his kids don't play it. They actually rather play on the old Wii than the new one. So that was that. And you know what? I had my Wii U for almost a year and didn't touch it up until this, about two months ago. But the new the Wii U plays Wii games. Why would you even bother having both? Right. You could transfer everything over. That's right. I did that. So I, I would do right. that, Super Del, if you want to try to get some, some, some length out of that thing. Just get um, – there is a, a process – and it is a process. It's not like this. It's easy, but it, it takes some steps. You have to get an uh, SD card, and you have to transfer your data from your old Wii to your new one. But basically, you'll have the uh, the whole Wii, the old Wii, will be exactly imaged to the new one. I did that yep. with mine. Yep. Yep. Same here. Show how that how that looks in a minute. So all your all the stuff you bought is over. Bring, this comes over, except the old Wii now becomes like a, a, a brand new one again. It doesn't remember any. It doesn't have any of your settings. So you're moving everything over. Right, it's not a copy, it's a move. Right. The only reason to keep the original Wii is because it plays GameCube games, which the Wii U does not. Right. Uh, but I have my GameCube for that, and my GameCube additionally plays Game Boy games. So oh, you got that the thing attachment on there. Yep. So there you go, Super Dale. I would I would just uh, move everything over to the to the new one and get them get them on it. And I think yep. you know. Like, they launched the system a year too early. If they launched it with all the stuff that they've got out for it now, like this one, uh, Pikmin 3, I'm having a great time with. The new Super Mario game, the Super Mario 3D World is awesome. Um, there's some good stuff out. Now, I need to point out that Jimmy briefly was in first place. This is, the, I think, the first time in the entire tournament I was not in first. Wow. Uh, so I have put him back in his place. Good. Keep him in his place. you got to keep him humble. That's right. I can hear him laughing right now, even though I know, even though I can't hear. Why can't we do like a chat on this game? Is it is that not something that Nintendo allows? They support chat uh, in the lobby, but okay. that's it. And, and in the lobby, it's friends. like pre like uh, determined stuff, so you can't have like a headset chat or something. Well, no, you you can do voice chat in the lobby oh, with your friends. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. But then once the game starts, it goes away, There's which no is why stuff. I usually tell people, you know, when you get on Mario Kart, also get on Skype, and we'll chat there. That's how I did a uh, cross-channel collaboration with a, one of my viewers named Gaming Media. Okay, cool. Now, did Nintendo do a content ID on your Let's Plays for the Nintendo games? or? Oh, yeah, every yeah. single one. Yeah. And actually, there is a new game coming out tomorrow called Shovel Knight, which I am doing a Let's Play of, and I backed them on Kickstarter. So before the game even came out, I had a direct line to the developers, and I said, are you going to let people do Let's Plays? They said, sure. And I yeah. said, are you going to let people monetize it? They said, sure. And I asked, are you going to post a policy on your website that tells YouTube it's okay to do that? And they said, oh, we didn't realize that was necessary. Yeah, so no, my now it is, unfortunately. So at, right. So at my request, they put it up there, and I've now uploaded 10 videos ready to go live tomorrow at 9 a.m. when the embargo ends, and YouTube has already approved them for monetization. Oh, good. So you're good to go. Yep. I haven't finished the game. I was hoping to do a complete Let's Play and have that ready in time for the game's release. But 10 videos is pretty good. I think there'll probably be like 16 videos for the whole game. Well, that's great. And you're getting it. It's always good to be first with this stuff, I found. That's kind of the... 
yeah. kind of the trick with it. Yeah, I was thinking about scheduling the videos to go live every half hour so that I don't just dump it all on my viewers all at once. Right. But at the end of each video is a link to the next one, and I didn't want that link to be broken for half an hour. That's true. Yeah, you're almost so. better just doing it all at once. What I found with my channel is I've got great subscribers who come in and watch. I get about, I typically get about 10 per, actually about 25 to 10 percent of my initial viewership comes from the subscribers, um, and then a lot of it is search driven. So people searching for products and that sort of thing. It's been uh, kind yeah. of the big, the big driver of traffic for me. Yeah. So being early with the, one of the first videos that gets a lot of subscriber views initially is a, is the best way to hit your search uh, engine optimization. Yeah, just like how in uh, real estate, it's all about location. And with YouTube, it's all about b timing. You got to right. be there first. That's what got my unboxing videos, literally millions of views. Yeah, that was amazing how you got the, I mean, that really put you on the map. None of, I would not not have done any of this had it not been for that first Wii U video. And that was a mistake. That was an accident. Yeah, it was, it was just you t taking the thing out of the box. Yeah, I mean, I had just gotten home from Peru, for which I had bought this new DSLR camera, and I'm like, hmm, I took some nice stills while I was down at Machu Picchu. I wonder if it can do video. Right. Let me launch a second so career I, now with it. <laughs> practically. Yeah. I mean, I'm actually, uh, around the same time that unboxing happened, I was offered an adjunct faculty position at a local college. I've been doing that for the last two years, and I actually just told them I need to take the fall semester off to develop my uh, video skills so I can come back and teach that to my students. Oh, that's great. It's a little sabbatical already. Yeah, so I'm going to be focusing on my YouTube channel for a semester. That's great. That's cool. Yeah, it's one thing I wish I had was a little bit more time. So, like, I try to make as much, get as much done on the weekends as I can. Yeah. That's been the big thing. I, I bought all this equipment, actually, to speed up my workflow. So I do very little editing now. Good. I do like 700 takes until I get it. <laughs> I get it right. Right. But, right. Um, but the key I found was just getting the equipment in here just to reduce the amount of steps. Yep. And even this wasn't that hard to set up. That was why I bought that video thing because that that made a, a big difference in in the setup and the you know the futz with computers and everything. So. Hmm. So let me talk about we talk about the the retro games and stuff. The games that I have more have fond memories about are not like these overly violent shooting games, you know, the ones that people complain about. Yep. And I'm finding as I get older that like the Call of Duty stuff, I, I just don't, it doesn't appeal to me anymore. And I, we talked about this the other day offline. Yeah. I wanted to get your take on that. I mean, I, I find like what Nintendo's doing to be a, a lot more fun uh, for a variety of reasons. And I think part of it is, is you know, I'm a father now. I, I got a different, you know, my, my life perspective is different, but... And I, and I don't think, you know, games are the, the cause of a lot of society's ills necessarily. But at the same time, you know, they're very realistic. I don't think I'd want my daughter watching me play these games. You know what I mean? But I'd watch. I'd be okay with her watching me play Mario. Although I'd rather have her watch me doing something, do something more educational. <laughs> but right. Um, but you know, I, I was looking back, like when I was thinking about our little little pod netcast tonight. Like, what did, you know, what what did I really love playing as a kid and almost to a to a game i think like the most shooter kind of game that i played was was contra which you know you could argue is just you versus aliens so it's not a lot of photorealistic violence you know um that was uh about the extent of of the games that i had fond memories of were, were that were violent per se was was that one yeah, I did a Let's Play of Contra 3 a few months ago, and, you know, talk about doing 700 takes, I did, like, four or five of that one. I mean, that game's a lot tougher than I remember. That game's hard. Uh, they're, they're all hard. Yeah. Have you ever read Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics? No. One of the things he talks about in there is that the less detail there is in any image or graphic, the easier it is for the person to relate to. Because, you know, let's take... Uh, the, the main character from The Last of Us, Joel, I think his name is, mm -hmm. for the PlayStation 4. Yeah. You know, very, very detailed character, chiseled looks, uh, very specific voice and tone when you hear him talk. He has a background, a story. He's a real character. Right. You don't see yourself as Joel. You don't really become Joel. You're controlling somebody else. Whereas with Pac-Man, he's a circle with a slice missing, and right. that's all he is. Right. And and since he's basically a blank slate, you're more easily able to 
overlay your own personality and character into him. So you talk about how you're in the maze and you're running around trying to avoid the ghosts as opposed to Joel is doing this. Right, right, right. Because you're not, right, you're, you're, almost, you're, almost, you're almost becoming the character because there is so little provided for you. Right. You know, you have to, it's kind of like reading a book. Your imagination fills in the blanks. And, and so I, I kind of like the simpler games because I become a part of the game more easily. There's less already there that I need to set aside to make room for myself. You know, I think that is a, a very good point. Yeah, because like the, the, the stuff that now requires a lot of time to play, that a lot of story mm -hmm. investment, I just don't, I just don't, I just can't get into those because I just don't have time. Um, I, mean, I also, I, you know, like this, I could play this for hours. <laughs> right. You know? I mean, I, I do like story. Part of that mm -hmm. is just a difference in genre. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I like Mario Kart because I can pick it up, put it down for a few minutes. But I also like story games because I can see a progression. I can... You know, pick it, just the same reason I like Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Every episode moves you toward a goal. Right. You know, whereas, you know, after, you know, you and I have been playing Mario Kart for almost an hour so far tonight, and at the end of that hour, other than the memory of a good experience, I'm not going to have anything to show for it. Right. Whereas I've, I've been playing Final Fantasy, I'd be that much closer to saving the world. That's true, right? You're progressing towards the final goal. Right. And I guess sometimes with these things too, like you can level up sort of in this game, but once you've unlocked everything, is it is it appealing anymore, right? That's the Yeah. That, that, I mean, then they'll hit you up for Mario Kart number four <laughs> or, or nine or whatever. Yeah. I mean this is one of the reasons why the last Final Fantasy game I ever played, and I didn't finish it either, was Final Fantasy ten for the PS two. And that's because it was the first Final Fantasy game to have voice acting. Oh, interesting. You know, all the other Final Fantasies before that, I mean, the Written. characters were becoming more and more defined, but nonetheless, they were still mute, and I could fill in the blanks, I could overlay myself into the game, and then Final Fantasy X comes along, and they are full-fledged characters, and they were awful. The script was awful, the voice acting was awful, and I'm like, I never realized before just how awful these plots are until they brought it to life for me. That's, it. That's a good point. And, you know, I, I looked at... Um... Like my library from growing up, the stuff that I really liked. So I was I was a big PC gamer when I got a, became a teenager. So you know, a lot of the, the Genesis games that came out in the in the mid to late '90s, I didn't really get into. Um, on the PC, I loved Space Quest, like Space Quest Four. Yep. Because um, that that was a story driven thing, but it was it was funny, you know. And they had the CD-ROM version, so I got my CD-ROM drive on my computer in like '92 or '91. And that was amazing to be able to have like a well, and that was a well acted game. They had real cartoon voice actors doing that one. It was one of the first good ones. Um, Day of the Tentacle was another one that had you know, yep. really good quality voice acting. Then it was all that garbage on the Sega CD, <laughs> the Sewer Shark, and the <laughs> all this right. junk uh, full motion video games that had come out. Um, so the PC games were just so much, so much better, but it yeah. was. Uh, it, it's, now, did you did you back the Kickstarter for Space Venture? Is that the, the one that was written by the Space Quest guys, or is being? Yes. By, yes. Yes, I did. Yep. Yeah, I'm a backer as well. The original release date was February of 2013, so I, they've missed that a little bit. Yeah, but they're giving uh, a lot of like updates on a regular basis, so that was, that yeah, was comforting. Yeah, their, their latest Kickstarter update was June 7th, so just about two weeks ago, and in that they actually avoided giving a full release date, a final release date, because they didn't want to commit to something. Uh, but they are working on it. I may have un actually unsubscribed from those updates just because there are so darn many of them. <laughs> I don't doing care. It all the time. I said, Look, we trust you. You're going to be fine. <laughs> yeah, do like, I don't care about the development of the game. I just want to play the game. Yeah, right. Exactly. But, but at the same time, sometimes I like the idea of the game more than the actual game. Like, I backed the Leisure Suit Larry reboot. Yeah, that was not very good. Well, I, even though I backed it and I got a copy of it, I never actually played it. Yeah. I, I I played it for a little bit and I was like, yeah, I, you know, it's the same game. They just put, they just, you know, freshened up the graphics. That's what yeah. I liked about the uh, the space adventure, whatever they call it, is that it's a kind of a new, exactly, a new, game, new IP. Yep. Yep. And that's the great thing about Kickstarter is that they will own the IP when they're done. Right. Whereas and it's hard, and it's hard to make these games. I mean, these, you know, it used to be easy to do this, or not easy, but it was you could you could do it Easier. with right. You could do it with a team of three or four people. Like Sonic the Hedgehog was four people. Yeah. That was Although it. conversely, indie games nowadays, a lot of those are being made by three or four people. They are. And you know what? They're fun. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I mean, just this evening I interviewed Logan Harrington, who produced this game called Gone, and she 
if you watch the credits of the game, there are several names associated with it. But when I asked her what she did with that game, she's like almost everything. She had her hand in almost everything. Now you and I are Apple II enthusiasts. And yes. back when we had our Apple IIs, we still have our Apple IIs, of course, but as our kids, when they were our primary computing device, um, that was it. Indie developers who would, who would put their game on a floppy disk, put it in a plastic bag, and then try to find a software store chain to buy them, right? Yep. And it was amazing because you would find, like, you'd go to somebody's house, and there'd be this game that you'd never heard of. Like, there was no marketing. There was, like, you, you just had to stumble across these things somewhere. And I loved, I loved trading games as a kid. Mm. You know, that's not something you do anymore, really. You no. just... You wait for, like uh, you just wait for it to go on sale on Xbox Live and then you download it. Right, and you have it, and it's only yours. You can't even you can't even lend it any. Yeah, you, the lending the games thing that was a big a big thing. And again, because the games were so freaking expensive and your income was limited, <laughs> so it was uh, it was a lot more scarcity. Now you can get a, a flash cart and everybody can go in there. Did I did I just lose everybody? Uh, I think the game is over. Oh, did we? Uh, we, do, we did the we did the set whole tournament of courses. Wow. Yeah, so it ended with I have 47 points, Jimmy has 22, and you have 12. <laughs> well, that was better. That was better than I thought it was going to end up with. So um, that was uh, that was that was great. This was fun. I think this we should try to do this again. I'd love to hear from people watching. So we we got up to looks like we've been up to uh, 12 concurrent viewers. So we we had more than I wasn't sure what we'd get actually. So um, so I'd love to hear from people how uh, they they say now. Night Gamer FX is a, he's an indie team. He's got a programmer friend of his. Hey, by the way, if you guys want to call in right now, we'll, we're probably going to wrap this up in about five minutes, but uh, go to lon.tv slash call, and you can come right into our hangout here and chat with us. I'd love to, I'd love to talk with uh, all of you watching so we can commiserate. I haven't done one of these live things before. I'm not sure what you're, what you're supposed to do. but <laughs> So we played Mario Kart. That was... Uh, that was it. So lon.tv slash call. It'll boot up your uh, Google Plus Hangout thing, and you'll pop into the Hangout here and chat with us. So I will leave your video off. And while that's happening, you know what I'm going to do, Ken? I'm going to show you. Uh, let me switch to my computer screen here. This is Open EMU. And what you can see on the side here is all the systems that Open EMU supports. It's a Mac-only thing. Hmm. And what you do is you drag your game in, and it... it downloads artwork and you just double click on it and it just launches it no matter what system you know no matter as long as it's one of these systems that it, that it supports and here we go we are in uh, Mario Kart this is the original one so it, it's come a long way and you can't see it now because you're not on the stream there but uh, uh, it's pretty cool so this was the original and I never really played yep. this I don't think uh, my roommate had this <coughs> So uh, we weren't able to play that one. And then the, the Nintendo 64 version my brother had. So that one's here. No, I remember being in grade school when the Super Nintendo version came out, and my friend Scott came over, and we stayed up till like 5 a.m. playing that game. It was ridiculous. We oh, were Super immediately Nintendo? hooked. Yeah. And then my youngest brother and I, he's five years older than me, we basically spent an entire summer playing that game. We... At the end of the summer, we had raced 500 battles against each other. <laughs> uh, the final score was 300 to 200 him. Wow. So there is somebody better than me out there, but yeah. I, don't think he's, I don't think he's kept up his skills. He's gotten married and raised kids, and unlike you, he has chosen not to balance that with games. Yeah, you gotta, you know, I think you got to have the games in there a little bit. So I'm looking forward to like my daughter's reaction to all this stuff that I used to play with as a kid because I have a feeling that I'm going to be laughed at especially when we look at the atari games so um. well i asked i asked my brother for his son's sixth birthday recently may i buy him an 8-bit nintendo and he said no and i was so disappointed because i feel like it's my responsibility to be the nerd influence in that right. child's life exactly and if it's not for me he's just going to grow up to be a jock i mean like <laughs> my, my brother and his son recently went to an atlanta braves baseball game i'm like no, you shouldn't be playing that. You should be playing, like, RBI baseball on the Nintendo. Right. Oh, yeah, exactly. you got to do some more do some more of the gaming. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't think, especially, you know, there's some games you can certainly point to that are really not kid-appropriate, but there's some, there's some good ones out there that I think are, are, are fun. And, you know, like, 
I, you know, it's funny because uh, you hear all this stuff about, oh, you know, these kids are not going outside and, and they're not for some reason. I don't know, you know why they're not anymore, but we had all these games. And, oh, uh, Super Dell doesn't believe I'm live. Um, so Jordan, uh, Jaden, Cordell Jr., Miracle, Kendall, and Chris. Wow, you got a house full there. Um, tell your dad to transfer your old Wii to your new one, and everything will be on, on one device, and then you have an extra Wii in the house to play with. So you get two for the price of, of two. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but um, what was I saying? So, you know, like we would play video games, then we go outside. Yep. You know, part of it maybe comes back to that story thing in that these games, you know, the games that we played were like this Mario Kart thing. You could play it for an hour and then leave. You know, you, you didn't have this commitment where you had to work your way through this story. But we'd play um, Qbert on the, on the ColecoVision, do a little Qbert, yep. some uh, Gorf. Gorf was a great one on the ColecoVision. Yeah, I think I had that on one of the Ataris. Okay. Yeah, so. I, ne I never played the Intellivision. My cousin had a ColecoVision, which I would, you know, I was... So excited when I got over there because just like you said, it's games that you'd never heard of before. Yeah, the Coleco is amazing. I had I had like I went through eight of them because the Coleco would break constantly. Uh, ah. <laughs> it was well, it was not very well built. Like the one I have now, I haven't turned it on in years. But it's, I, the last time I played with it a couple, you know, five, fifteen years ago, it still works. So I, I would assume it'll work if I turn it on. But um, the graphics on that were like light years beyond the Atari. That was. That was a oh, really, yeah. and you could buy this um, adapter for it that would play the Atari 2600 games. So you have this one game device that would that would run everything. It came with Donkey Kong. So yeah, was but wasn't it wasn't it a purposely bad version of Donkey Kong? Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't as good as the as the as the real thing as the arcade version. It was close, but like I remember when I went to like the arcade, I was like, oh my gosh, the the barrels are catching on fire and they're they're coming back. Like you know, there was a, there was a definite difference there, but it was passable. The Donkey Kong Junior version was actually really good. Oh okay. Um, that one was a was a was a really decent version of it. Let's see, we have some more. Uh... I just seem to recall there was some version of Donkey Kong that they made to be bad because they wanted to show. Like, Nintendo didn't want that system to succeed, so they wanted to make it look bad. It could have been the Coleco one. Possibly. I could be getting my details mixed up, or yeah, maybe it's it just urban legend. Thing here. I could track it down. Um, there was that. I played the heck out of Zaxxon. That was, that was one I played a lot of. Um, and the arcade version, when I, so that my bowling alley had you know, the, arc, the, the arcade. And you know, now, like, you could, your home system is every bit as powerful as the arcade stuff. The arcades were like, Oh, you know, just the, worth every quarter because they were just so incredible. And so I went in and played Zaxxon in the arcade after playing it on the ColecoVision. I was good on the ColecoVision. I could get, I could just keep going. And you get to the arcade and you were, you were done in like, you know, 30, 30 seconds or so. Um, Super Dell has an Ouya, as do I. And that is uh, a great system to play retro games on. Oh, because you just hack an emulator into it? Yeah, and actually they're all in... Ouya is going to get sued out of existence at some point, but they have all of the um, emulators in their store, so they're official um, releases. And I, I have a video that I did of the Ouya. Uh, they have this thing called um, uh, Nostalgia is the, is the name of the app. Let me pull it up here real quick for you to take a look at it. It is this ROM manager that acts as a launcher for all of this stuff, and it is... Uh, it is really cool. Let me skip through the ad here, and then I'll show you what it looks like. It's um, let's go camera two. This is weird. Like I just did a jump cut there. So what uh, I just I just joined an open tournament on Mario Kart 64, and we got a full 12 players here. Oh, do you really? Yeah. That should be a fun little race there. So um, it, it's this launcher that just you can just load in your whole library, and it just uh pops up it's really yeah it's really neat really really cool so well can i think we've been about an hour here so i don't want to keep you this was fun we should yeah. we should do this and i think what we should do i'd love to hear what people's reactions were to the to the broadcast here um because i didn't really have like a you know a, a show notes or kind of producer notes to kind of go into this with so i think maybe next time like i'll i'll put together some discussion points so we can uh talk about some of this stuff there's a lot of interest sure. in this retro stuff oh absolutely and we all we lived through it. we were we were the ones they marketed to during this period of time so it'd be kind of fun to uh, do that moving forward 
By the way, I un there's some event coming up. I think it's called the K Kineticon. Oh, Kineticon. Or, huh? Are you going to that? I have heard. I heard about it. What is is that the Comic Con that's in Connecticut? Uh, kinda. I think it's a, like a a gaming fantasy sci-fi. I'm not entirely sure. But I'm sure if you did a Google search, it'd pop right up. Yeah, maybe we, we should. We got to meet up. We have never actually met in person. Nope. As far as I know, you're just a computer simulation. Yep, I could be. I'm a I mean, actually, <laughs> I sit uh, here in my you, basement and make YouTube videos. Actually, I don't know if you remember this, but when we first spoke two years ago on the Open Apple podcast, and your voice came on the line, I'd never heard you before. I'd never watched any of your YouTube videos, and I actually thought you were using like uh, a Mac voice generator or something because <laughs> like your, your voice sounded too perfect i'm like is that you or your computer you know what it is i use this uh sure sm58 mic it's one of those cardioid mics so it's like it just it, it it was made for vocal artists not that i am one but uh it was it was really slick by the way here's the kineticon site so july 10th what... through 13th oh, okay so it's coming up soon it's coming up soon and it looks like uh yeah it's kind of like a uh, comic-con but in connecticut Yep. Yeah, I, that's the weekend before I leave for Kansas Fest, and I just got too much going on. So tell us about Canvas Fest before we leave, because I think that people might find that to be an interesting event. Well, actually, of more relevance is before I go to Kansas City, I'm going to stop in Chicago, and there are a couple of retro arcades there I'm going to check out. Oh, cool. One is called uh, the Underground Retrocade, and I believe I discovered that through an ad on the podcast No Quarter, mm -hmm. which, you may, you, which you may listen to. And then also there's the Galloping Ghost Arcade, which recently held an unsuccessful fundraiser on Kickstarter, uh, but they were visited by, oh, what's his name? Um, Rob O'Hara. He has a podcast all about retro stuff, and he went to the Galloping Ghost and was happy about it. And there's also a Geek Bar in Chicago, which is not open yet, but should be by the time I get there. So anyway, I'm going to check out those arcades in Chicago and then take a train down to Kansas City for the 25th annual Apple II convention oh, known as Kansas year, City. Huh? Yep. Wow. And it's the first year, like, of 25 keynote speakers. This is the first time we've had a female keynote speaker. And who is that? That would be Margot Comstock, who was the founder of Soft Talk Magazine. Oh, cool. That was the disc man, right? They would mail you a disc every every month? Uh, the soft disc came oh, with soft was disc a disc. Is that. Okay. Uh, I think Soft Talk was an actual print magazine. Got it. And it was founded with her own money that she had won on a game show. I think she uh, won on Password. Really? Yeah, and she took her prize money home and launched an Apple II magazine. It's a good investment. I, I think so. That's really cool. Now, Woz came last year, right? Woz was in the audience last year, partly because Randy Wigginton was the keynote speaker, and Randy was Apple employee number seven, I believe. Okay. And so Woz wanted to reunite with his old chum. Not that they haven't kept in touch, but you know, if you, I think uh, Woz was in the area anyway. I think he had family to visit, so he stopped by Kansas City. So sum this up for me. So when Pete, so Kansas Fest is at is in Kansas at a university for like it's like a week long event, right? Yeah, it's in Kansas City, Missouri at Rockhurst University. It starts on Tuesday. The keynote speech is on Wednesday. Sessions are Thursday and Friday. And you stay in the dorms, and, right? Yep. So you stay right where the event is being held. So it's really a 24-hour affair. The sessions may be scheduled 9 to 5, but you are with your fellow attendees 24-7. And they are, you don't they, are, have, they are hardware hackers, right? They love doing projects while they're there, right? There, there's hardware hacking. There are game competitions. Uh, we're doing a Structurist tournament this year, which is kind of like Tetris. Hmm. Also, somebody recently ported Flappy Bird to the Apple II. I saw that. So that was a legit port. It looks pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Dagan Brock released it. It's called mm -hmm. Flapple Bird. Flapple Bird. And there's been talk of maybe having a Flapple Bird tournament. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, and uh, my friend Sarah, who I went to undergrad with, is going to be attending her first Kansas Fest and hosting a workshop on how to sew your own Apple II ornament out of embroidery floss. Wow, so you're even doing crafts now, too. This is cool. Oh, yeah, a little yeah. bit of everything. Last year, there was a crafts session where you made your own floppy disk sleeves, you know, oh, sort of an cool. origami session. Right. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. yeah, and uh, so this will be my seventh, not my seventh, my 17th year attending Kansas Fest. How has it changed? Was, because it, it, it seems like it's, there's been a resurgence, in, in, as, just as there is in retro gaming, retro computing is becoming a, a, there's a big resurgence there, too. 
Very much so. The attendees, uh, we're going to have about 60 attendees, whereas maybe eight years ago we were down to 28, so it's more than doubled since wow. then. It's yeah, it's. Uh, we have about a dozen first-timers coming this year, people who have never come to Kansas Fest in their lives. And uh, it's just people who, you know, like they keep, they now have the income that they can pursue hobbies like this and they right. can afford to take a trip to Kansas City. And also, you know, it's sort of uh, ironic or nostalgic for younger people to use the computers that their parents used. Right. So, so you know, we have people in their early to mid-20s coming to Kansas Fest, and, you know, they came out after the Apple II did. We have one kid this year. He's coming to Kansas Fest for the first time. He's giving a presentation, and he's 12. No kidding. Yeah, he uses the Apple II for science fair projects at huh. school. And, you know, it's a, it's a perfect platform for that kind of thing. It's, it's a simple machine. There's not a huge OS that's going to get clogged up with stuff, and you can put ser you have serial inputs on it. You can, you can do things with it. Exactly. That's really cool. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I was thinking about when my daughter gets a little bit older that you maybe have her start on my old Apple II GS. Sounds yes. like a great idea. You wouldn't be the first one to do that. Disconnected from the internet. She's not going to stumble on anything. She can you know, learn how the machine works. Because you had to learn how it worked in order to use it. It just didn't turn on. You had to, <laughs> you had yeah. to understand it a little bit. So. Actually, I, ju I just shipped to the printer today the latest issue of Juice GS. Oh, good. I'm looking our... forward to getting that. Me too. And <laughs> the cover story is all about BASIC, the programming language that turned 50 years old last month. And it talks about how you know when BASIC was developed, being a programmer and being a computer user were the same thing. You had to know how to program the computer in order to use it. Right. And the people who invented BASIC want to lower the barrier for entry, make it easier to learn how to use a computer. And I remember getting these magazines. You know, it was three, two, one contact had the these, and you would you would have BASIC source code in the magazine, and you'd have to type it in. You would spend hours doing it. And then it wouldn't yep. work. <laughs> You'd have some, but you know, it was a great way to learn how to program because what I used to do was uh, type in all the code. Um, you learn from the things that you typed incorrectly what, you know, what happened. So, oh, that did that. So now I know how this thing works. And then you could also decide, oh, I'm going to change the text of this thing to operate differently instead of it having say this when this happens, have it say that when that happens. And it was a really neat way to kind yep. of uh, get you know get a lay of the land on that. So. Yeah. Um, cool stuff. You know, you know, when I teach at Emerson, the first night of class, I review the history of computers and the internet. And one of the questions, questions I ask my students is, you know, if you are publishing a magazine and you want to include a program, how would you do it? And they would say, well, you could give a download link, you could give a QR code, you could include a CD, all these things. I'm like, great. What about 30 years ago? How would you include a program? And two out of three times, they just have nothing. They have yeah. no idea. It was hard. <laughs> They're like, can you include a floppy disk? I'm like, no, it's cost prohibitive, it's fragile, right. it's uh, sensitive to magnets, it will never survive the trip. You know what amazes like, me what? is like the, the early pirate BBSs that were storing, you know, all of this these games that I mean they didn't have a lot of storage on the computer itself to even store all these these compressed disk images of all these games. It must have been a real you know, it was it was hard to move data around back then. Yeah, and it was unreliable. Like yeah. you, when you turn off your computer, you just have to hope that next time you put that floppy disk in, it still has your PhD and your dissertation on there. Yeah, that was a big problem, <laughs> and it got worse. Those three and a half inch floppies, I, I, there must have been like some quality control issues over time, but it got progressively worse. And then what I used to do, I was too cheap to buy like a box of because box of floppies was like fifteen twenty bucks, so yep. a ten. So I would take the AOL discs that would come in the mail. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's in the, when they were mailing those discs out, and those were those were great for uh, for doing mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Well, Ken, I don't want to keep you, so we've been an hour here, and I think this was a lot of fun. Yeah, and I agree. We we haven't lost any viewers the whole time, so I guess we must be doing something right, and we will probably do this again. So here's what I want everyone who's watching to do: is um, leave a comment either in the in the event page, which will stay active after this is over with. I've got to cut the Nintendo music out of it before I get a, a copyright strike. Um, and, uh, you know, what should we do next time? Because I think I'd love to have, like, a, a directed conversation. Maybe we bring in a moderator while we're playing who can, who can guide us a little bit. Because there's um, – there was a – you know, there, there was a – it was neat being 
a kid who was like following this industry while I was being marketed to by it. And I think there's some great conversations we can have around that. So sure. Um, I think we'll look at maybe, that. maybe we should start a podcast. Maybe we should do that. Hmm. We got time. You know, somebody, uh, a friend of mine launched her own podcast about two months ago. So she's released five episodes and she posted a comment on Facebook today that said, Oh my God, guys, seriously, podcast money is ridiculous. Next time you see us, we're going to be throwing thousand dollar bills out of our Teslas. <laughs> and I'm like, really? You must be podcasting about a very different subject than I am. Yeah, I've, I've never not seen it. No, yeah, I've never seen that happen. It's uh, it's hard. You know what the problem with podcasting is, is the 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 audience discovery is really difficult. So YouTube, I built and this YouTube thing, it, just like for you, it's been crazy for me. Like the last I'm, I'm seeing exponential subscriber growth now um, mm. where, you know, like I'm doubling, tripling, you know, whatever, every every week almost on subscriber numbers. And so I, I passed 10,000 last week. I'm already like on my way to 11,000 already. Um, but people find me because they're searching for the stuff that I'm talking about. And there's a platform where that happens. Yep. And podcasting, there's just no platform. So unless people know who you are, you know, it's hard yeah. to, to build. I mean, and the exception would be like Leo Laporte, who's built an empire around it. But he was known. Like he had, you know, all these uh, years as, as a TV host, yeah. an active radio host that really made it work for him. Well, you know, I'll let you in on a secret. This will be the first time I've stated this publicly. Um, but starting next week, I'm going to be launching a new podcast. Oh, are you? What's it called? That's actually not determined yet. I have okay. a name that I, I have a name that I really like, but okay. I'm not sure everybody else likes it. Got it. Uh, but the, one of the reasons I like it is because it nobody else has taken it yet. It's available, and that might be because of the problems that everybody else sees with it. But anyway, what's the? Is there the a, a specific topic? Is it like a, in your wheelhouse yep. of? It, it's it's about a specific aspect of gaming, but okay. what's uh, relevant to this discussion is that it's going to be. Uh, first and foremost a video podcast but there will also be an audio edition of it oh cool so I'm hoping that I'll be capitalizing on this audience I've already developed of 30,000 subscribers on YouTube and then in the links of each video of each episode I'll say if you want the audio version click here to go to iTunes that is exactly how to do it yeah because if you were to do it audio only and not have you know that that content on YouTube it'd be really hard to build to build it out right and I even considered developing a you know, original social branding to go with this new podcast brand. But then I thought, why well, start from scratch? I already have all these followers. Let's just yeah, no, count. you gotta you gotta use you know not use but but you know uh, take. I don't want to sound like we're taking advantage of. But not, I don't mean that. But you know, basically right. reaching the audience that is following you for a specific. I mean, these people subscribe to you because they like right. what you do around that topic. So you know, I've tried other things on my channel. Every time I do something a little bit different. I, I don't get viewership. So people are subscribing to me for very specific things, and I want to be able to provide that for them. So Super Dell says, do it. So he will listen to us. <laughs> so we, right. we've got an audience, so we should, we should do it. You know, it be kind of fun. Maybe it's something where um, we take like 20 minutes, and we pick a game that we liked to play when we were a kid, a kid put it up on screen, yep. talk about it. You know? Or maybe, you know, like... Uh... Maybe when there's a new game that comes out, to have some sort of a, a contemporary hook, we'll look at one of its predecessors. Not necessarily, a, not necessarily a same game in the series, but you know, like we could take a first-person shooter mm -hmm. and then go look at Castlevania, not Castlevania, the look at Castle, uh, Castle Wolfenstein exactly right. for the Apple II. Right. You know, we, the sequel the to which was one of the first first-person shooters. Yeah, we, could, we should do that. Yeah, so like. You know, there's a podcast called How Did This Get Made? We can call ours Where Did This Come From? That's a good one. That's a good idea. That's a great idea. So I think there there's a go. lot of, like, a retro stuff, but there's not, the, like, a lot of the story behind what it was. And I, I think there was, you know, I, I, I'm realizing I spent a significant portion of my childhood following all this stuff, and, and, and it's uh, be fun to do a, a living history of it. Yeah. So it would be kind of fun. Well, this was you know, cool, I, so... I I find nowadays I think I spend more time talking and reading about video games than I do playing video games. <laughs> like you know, just I, all the you know my RSS feed tells me all the latest games that are coming yeah. out and I read about them and I have an awareness of what's out there but I'm exactly not, with you. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I just don't, I, it's exactly it. I was like, wow, that looks really cool, but that's cool. Somebody else will play it. I watched the last right. time. <laughs> you know, what happened yeah. with me is that I, um, I started following some of these, like these big retro people on YouTube and that has just, so it started actually with the podcast you've been doing on the Apple II, going back to the earlier one you did, the, the A2 Central one, you know, the original, uh, the original I, podcast. Would, I'm sorry, I don't know which one you mean. You know, the, you were on that one. It was, you know, it was the, the podcast for a2central.com. Was that the, the website? A, A2 Central didn't have a podcast, but there was A2 Unplugged. A, A2, that was what it was, yeah. And you were on yep. that, weren't you? I was a guest on, okay. I think, two or three episodes. Okay, because I used to listen yep. to that one because I was – because you know what happened was 10, 10 years ago, uh, I started, like, reconfiguring my 2GS, which had been in a, in a, you know, in a Rubbermaid container in the basement for years, right? I took it out. And I said, I gotta start getting this thing like back to where I want, where I want it to be, because the stuff was cheap. So I bought memory. I got, um, I got the CFFA, the compact flash adapter. Yep. I got this thing like back to where it was when I was a kid, and that was right around the time I started listening to all this the retro podcast stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad I did it then because it would have cost me a fortune to do the same thing now. I even got a Transwarp GS in there and all this other stuff. Um, but I started following that, and then on YouTube, there's some really great retro gaming channels that are a lot of fun to because i'm finding stuff that i remembered being interested in as a kid and never had and to see like yep. a review of that was was kind of neat so that was cool and i did find the other day i found the tapes of that cable access show that i used to do oh you should put those on youtube yeah i, I gotta get them transferred and i'm gonna you know put a fine tooth comb over it but there was a and I'll, this is the last thing that we, we can go i i was um uh there was a in the magazines, there was all these uh, people that were selling mail order video games, and one of the stores, one of the big advertisers, happened to be in the next town over from me. It was called the Ultimate Game Club. Huh. And so I called them up, and I'm like, "Hey, I got this cable TV show. Can can you come on the show and talk about what you guys have there? Because they had all the import stuff too. So they had, you know, all the you know the usual American video games, but they had all this cool stuff from Japan. So they would let me come in and record and hook my camera up to it, uh, record all this stuff. They had a super graphics, which was like the, the souped up turbo graphics 16. They had, you know, all these Japanese, uh, uh, Sega games and Nintendo, you name it. Uh, and it was cool. We did like a couple of segments, uh, at their store. So I'm eager to find that because this was right in the middle of everything that was happening during that console wars book. <laughs> it was like 1989, 1991. It was in that, uh, in that time frame. So, uh, Oh yeah, dude. This is just the time you need to be uploading those videos. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, need to, I don't think I, I don't think my voice had changed yet, so we'll have to see, <laughs> we'll have to see how it came out. So, and now I got do, like, uh, you, you. You can do your own mystery science theater on your own videos. That might that might be appropriate. So, and if, hey, it could get it could get viewership. And now I've got this in my basement, which is like my own television studio, and I can do this, which is great. And yeah, Twelve people will watch. <laughs> it's fun. So, well, Ken, thanks for uh, spending your evening with me. Yeah, thank you for having me. And I'm going to go. Um, I think we'll let's uh, talk offline. We'll come up with some concept that won't take too much time on either in our either of our parts. Sounds and good, man. Put something together. So, thanks for doing this. All right, I'll talk to you later. Talk to you soon. See ya. And uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And uh, we're going to do this again. So just leave some comments. I'd love to hear what you think about it. Like, where should we go with this kind of concept? So we had a modern game. We were talking about retro stuff on there. Um, I think we could do that. We could even play a retro game and talk about maybe some stuff revolving that or whatever. So uh, give me some feedback, because I want to figure out uh, where we should try to take this live thing. Because I got all this equipment down here to do this. So we should probably do something with it every once in a while. So. So that will do it, and this is Lon Seidman, and Ken Gagney was here as well, and thank you for watching. I'm going to fade, fade the black now. Look at that. Ooh. And we're going to stop the event here.